lots are from 0.5 to 2 acres in size, and each of the lots has its own well and septic system. So we're located um, in this red uh, rectangle. So Butterfield Road is the last set of lights if you're going to Victoria before the Malahat. So here we have Butterfield Road, Boulding, Banco, and coming off, we have Terra Lane, Kearney Place, and Memory Lane. So this is the neighborhood I re represent. So th most of the members of the neighborhood received a letter from Flynnrow, and the letter gave notice of a water license for well 88152 located on the west side of Benko Road to withdraw about 20 million gallons of water annually to su supply a proposed new development of 100 plus homes. Responses were requested within 30 days at a time when many people are on holiday, so we took note of that. A pumpo test was conducted on well 88152 uh, in this summer of 2017, and this resulted in at least one neighborhood well going dry, another well being severely depleted, and a number of people reported increased sediment in their water. And several property owners, in fact, three property owners were informed by Flynn Road that their well was tested following the pump out test, and had no, there was no effect of the pump out test on their wells. And in fact, these three property owners ha have informed me that their well was not tested. So this brings up the question of the reliability of the qualified professionals responsible for the, doing the pump test. And from April 2019 minutes of the Mill Bay Waterworks District, we learned there was a discrepancy in the conclusions of the pump out test between the proponent's consulting company and Flinro. And from the minutes, the, the most significant discrepancy between Flinro and the hydrogeology reports from the well testing was the area of influence seems larger than what was suggested. Okay, we also found out that the Mill Bay Waterworks District is experiencing production problems with their existing wells. So the existing wells are producing anywhere from 7 to 31 percent of expected production. Hence the um, Mill Bay Waterworks commissioned a study of the two aquifers of interest. And there are two aquifers. One is a glacial till overburden, which is indicated by the orange-yellow here. And then the, un so this is aquifer 206, and then underlying aquifer 207 in the bedrock. So the official maps of aquifer 206 is in this area indicated here, but we do have properties on me Memory Lane and elsewhere where wells are only in a glacial till overburden. So I think this aquifer boundary should be extended a few more kilometers southward. And this is a map of aquifer 207, and this red rectangle <coughs> indicates the location of our neighborhood. Notice that it's in the southern two-thirds of the aquifer, our neighborhood. The conclusions of the Mill Bay Waterworks District Commission study, and this study was carried out by Western Water Associates Limited and a report submitted in November 2018. The conclusion is aquifer 206 is not being replenished even in wet years, and aquifer 207 is not replenished in dry years. So approximately half of the Mill Bay Waterworks wells are in aquifer 206 and the other half in 207. So even wells in aquifer 207 are not producing the expected volume of water, what was initially estimated. So this informs us that aquifer 207 is vulnerable to depletion. I think this, that's a logical conclusion. The Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy also recently commissioned an aquifer study. The report was uh, by SLR Consulting Canada Limited and submitted January 2017. And this study concluded that aquifer 206 is under severe replenishment deficit and the southern and western part of aquifer 207 has little water storage capacity and our neighborhood is in the southern part. So specifically, and this is a quote taken from the uh, Ministry of Environment report or commissioned report, water supplies will, 
will be limited in the Bonanza group, and the Bonanza group is a rock formation laid down 200 million years ago. Underlying the western and southern two-thirds of the aquifer area, the likelihood of identifying high-yield zones is low, and water supplies based on individual wells uniformly spread out is recommended, and this is in fact what we have at the moment. It continues, this is because there is little, there is likely very little available storage in this part of the aquifer due to the aquifer's low hydraulic conductivity due to a lack of fracturing. Potential well interference between existing and future proposed wells in this part of aquifer 207 could be due to low storativity of this bedrock, and the emphasis has been added by myself. And again, I repeat, our neighborhood overlies the southern two-thirds of this aquifer. You have just a little over three minutes. Okay, almost done. The report also states that aquifer 206 communicates with 207, with most of the communication being water going from 206 to 207. And at the moment, aquifer 207 is replenished in normal wet years, but not in dry years. If there's additional demand on 207, it may not be replenished in normal years. And if demand is great enough in the future, possibly not even replenished in wet years. Several people in our neighborhood have wells that draw from aquifer 206. So if 207 is the water tables lowered, this is going to have an impact on 206. Some of these people report that their wells are on the brink of sufficiency, and some say their wells go dry towards the end of the summer. I'd like to point out pump out tests have limitations. A pump out test will have a, an immediate effect on neighboring wells if the fractures connected to them are large. But if the fractures are fine, small, then you won't have an immediate effect. But long-term withdrawal of water would have an effect. And the neighborhood concern is licensing a well to produce water for a new development and then approving a new development when there is a high probability that the water supply of existing homes will be jeopardized should not be allowed. And the CVRD needs to do its own independent review of the local aquifers. It should not depend upon local improvement districts like the Mill Bay Waterworks District. In discussions with the Mill Bay Waterworks District, we were informed that the, the district is completely reliant upon Flinro and if Flynn Rower licenses a well, they're going to go ahead and use that water. And as far as we know, Flynn Rower has done no study of aquifers. The, the, the district solution to insufficient well production is to drill new wells into the same aquifers, despite at least one of the aquifers already being depleted. The main concern of the district is liability if a new well affects neighboring wells. So the CBRD needs to be very careful when improving new developments and needs to ensure there's adequate water supply, uh, not only for the new development, but that it doesn't have a negative effect on the existing homes. And we do not want a water crisis to develop within the Cowichan Valley. We already have enough problems with adequate water flow in our rivers during summer. And, and some members of our group. Thank you very much, Mr. Your link, and I'm seeing if there's any questions from the committee, and there is one. Director Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Bernard. That's, uh, that's good. Um, can you tell me what potential well interference means? If you have a new well and you start withdrawing large amounts of water, then neighboring wells may have a negative impact. So if their wells go dry, as in one case, the, the water test or they, their water levels drop. So one of the neighbors at some distance from the uh, tested well dropped by many meters in water level. That's good, thank you. Can I one follow up? Follow up. up. Um, and is there a possibility that I can get a copy of your presentation? Sure. Okay, I'll talk about it, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Director Acton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Bernie, for your presentation. And no doubt, Bernie has done his homework. I, we've uh, had his help in Shawnigan for many years. But uh, my question is, actually, I wasn't surprised about your comment about Flynn Rowe and, and the um, professional not having the same information. But the 100 homes that you mentioned, is yeah. that already approved development, or is that kind of a pre-approval thing? Well, there was some form of approval back in 2008 or 2009 by the CVRD. 
So I, I'm not sure what is this is. Is it Stonebridge? No, we we're actually talking about just the water and the aquifers. I don't think there's an application. I was that we specifically need to speak instructed about. not to mention any development. Specific there's development. developments in the okay. queue. So this was she's talking about water issues, and okay, that's what we're here. I to guess. Can you explain what that what that what you mean then by uh, the license? Is it kind of a pre-approval for a hundred homes? Like is Flynn Row no, saying you no, have enough no, water? No, no. Flynn Row is determining whether to license that well to withdraw 20 million gallons of water per year to supply 100 plus homes. So in discussions with the Mill Bay Waterworks District, we discovered not only will it supply 100 plus homes, but it will be linked up to yet another development to assist with water supply of that second development. Follow up, Director Thank Acton. you, thank you, Madam Chair. And so when you say 100 homes, you already have 70 homes hooked up, considered well, for that 100? we have 100? about 60 or so homes. Okay. But this is an additional 100 plus homes. Okay, 170 in the kind of, okay, thank you. Director Nicholson. Thanks, Bernie. I thought this was a really clear, um, interesting presentation. Um, and, you know, water is the big issue that we're all grappling with now. And this is a really good example of how I am not clear <laughs> on how, um, it, it's like we have this, we have these zones that exist and people's expectations of being able to develop that were created years ago and that are not up to, to date to our current water situations. And it's, it's kind of like we think about water at the last minute and it's crazy because, um, yeah, we just, it, the impact's huge. What we're, you know, like I'm experiencing in the Coke Silo watershed that there's actually been a minister order to turn off the farmers' um, irrigation because we're so short of water. And it's, it's because everything's connected and people forget that everything's connected. So your aquifer 206 is connected to 207 and when one person sucks water out, it pulls water away from other, other people. So it's, you know, it's a real challenge. And, and we've got these water work dis waterworks districts and we rely on Flinro for information and there's often a big gap of information. And, you know, like we have this new water, uh, drinking water, watershed protection service and it's not clear yet where we're gonna be focusing our, our resources to um, provide us with better information. But the big thing is we really need good information before we make decisions about moving ahead with develop further development in many areas. This one, the Coke silo for sure. So I, I don't know, and maybe the planners could explain to me how we're, we're kind of um, triaging this at this point, I guess is really what's ha what we need to do. Is that a question? Yes, or it's a question. What is your question for staff, exactly? How are we approaching these kind of Can you turn your microphone back on? How are we approaching these, uh, these kind of problems so they're not, we're not dealing with them at the very last moment like this? I'm not sure if staff can answer that because I think it, we've been working on it. Is Mr. Dennison yeah. around? I uh, don't see him. So maybe you can ask that after. Thanks, Director Nicholson. Director Salmon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just echo Director Nicholson and, um, and thank Bernie uh, for the presentation and thank all the neighbors for uh, coming today. Um, I just want to say, we're not looking at a specific application, of course, today, but uh, water is a huge issue in the whole valley, and particularly in Mill Bay. Um, we've got about, I believe, 1,500 lots approved from decisions uh, long ago or decades ago, and the, the trend is going the wrong way for water. So I really think um, Bernie's brought up a good point, and we'll be looking at this again, and we'll have to very carefully be thinking about how we do all this in future. I know we have a, a OCP harmonization we're working on um, and modernization that may may be able to work on it then but uh, just thank you for alerting us all I could make a f final comment there are too many jurisdictions involved in water issues so Flynn Row licenses wells but has no independent study of waters the Ministry of Environment has commissioned studies but it has plays no role in whether water can be withdrawn or not. And then you have other entities like these improvement districts that make decisions without adequate information, relying 
completely upon Flynn-Rose decisions. So I think this is a recipe for a catastrophe. Thank you. Welcome to the world of regional districts. Um, Director Morrison. Thank you. It's a great presentation. and It's actually kind of scary because when I first got elected, I probably would would have got lost after about your second or third slide and I actually understood all of it so it was, it was very clearly and well done so thank you for that um, so I've I've reviewed your your presentation material a couple or three times and and another thing about when I was first elected and director Yanni Donardo can or chair Yanni Donardo can attest to this is is when we considered um, applications a number of years ago the the fallback was that subdivision wouldn't happen if adequate water wasn't proven. So we could implement zoning and it wouldn't happen if there wasn't adequate supplies. We've now come to realize <coughs> that there's been challenges that have developed as a result of that. And the province has full jurisdiction over the licensing of wells and the likes. So I, I don't want to pose this as a leading question, but we are beginning to do the work on the aquifer mapping and, and surface water sources and that sort of thing. And I think it's important that, that that access to data is available at the regional district and for this this committee to make decisions. But it's, it's begging the question uh, with the full jurisdiction over water and subdivision <coughs> resting with the province. Are, are you suggesting that you would like to see that jurisdiction brought in local so that we have not only the data and the information but the ability to either act or not Absolutely. on, on yeah. decisions? Yeah, because it's at the local level that water issues affect us, right? Thank so. you. Well, I'd like to thank you very much. Not seeing any other hands. Thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> Working, uh, moving on now to six correspondents. We have C1. Uh, thank you, Mr. J Ms. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, item C1 is a, a request for attendance at the State of the Island Economic Summit, and that is for direction. Okay, so there is direction that um, we have a policy that over $500 it needs to be voted on, so I'd just like to turn to Director Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, this is my request to be able to attend this, uh, this uh, conference, because to me, the, the economic health of the whole island uh, is of importance even to the level of regional districts and um, especially with the island being designated as a free trade zone this is going to mean quite a lot of difference to the kind of infrastructure that we might need and how we need to plan for it in this area here as well um, the the total cost is unlikely to exceed 500 but the possibility arrives there I did uh, I have registered for this already um, because there was an early bird special which saved a hundred dollars it was 399 instead of 499 and um, basically I'm seeking approval um, that if I do go over the 500 that uh, it is um, it is okay I, either way I'm going to attend anyway and if it does cut if the board turns this approval down then I, I will still attend and, and meet the extra cost myself but it would be nice because I don't think I'm the only one who might be interested in going to this one I believe there could be interest from other people as well director Morrison well I simply move that the request be um, it be recommended to the board that the request be authorized under the policy okay it's been moved and seconded and is there would there also be anyone else that would be interested in going to this at this time no. seeing none okay so the question is to approve that all in favor any opposed motion is carried moving on to c2 uh thank you madam chair um <coughs> item c2 is a request uh, to attend a conference for Liverpool Cities Forum, and that is 
request comes from Director Nicholson. Director Nicholson. Yes, I'd like to go to this um, conference down in Victoria at the end of October, which is uh, focused on um, adaptation to climate change. And uh, I'm, I think it'll cost more than four, $500 by the time I, uh, it's a couple of day event. And the registration is uh, close to $500, I think. So, Director Morrison? Move, we recommend to the board that this be authorized under the policy. Okay, it's been moved, seconded. Is there any question on this? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on now to information. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. There are no information items. Very much. We're moving on now to R1. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, item R1 is a verbal report and PowerPoint presentation from the Environmental Resources Assist Assistant Summer Student regarding Recycling and Waste Management Division's Recycling Audit. Welcome. Jason. Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, every, every year, the Waste and Recycling Division hires a summer student. Uh, this year, we we're lucky enough to find an excellent candidate in Rhiannon Morrison. Uh, Rhiannon is currently studying at the University of, of Victoria, where she's completing a double major in political science and environmental studies. Uh, during her time here in the, uh, the summer, Rhiannon has been focused uh, on the reducing curbside contamination. Uh, she's completed some great work in terms of uh, actually getting out in the field, going house to house, looking in totes, and then quantifying that data that, that we can use to um, reach out to residents and provide education and also some, some enforcement. Uh, there's a report following uh, Rand's presentation that's um, related to the education and the enforcement, enforcement that's happening with curbside collection. Um, for now, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Rihanna Morrison. She's going to do a PowerPoint presentation for the committee uh, on her work this summer. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. And welcome, Rihanna. You know you're getting old when I remember you when I think you're about two. So now you're in university and a few years in. Yep. Welcome. <laughs> Moving quickly. Right. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Good afternoon, my name is Rhiannon Morrison and I'm the Environmental Resource Assistant, Summer Student for Recycling and Waste Management. This summer we have been conducting recycling audits across the Couch and Valley as part of the curbside contamination reduction strategy. Today I will be presenting the results from this recycling audit and I will be answering any questions you may have at the end. So from June 3rd to July 22nd, auditing staff audited over 3,000 recycling totes, refused over 500 contaminated totes, and visited every CVRD electoral area that receives curbside recycling collection. During the audits, various contaminants were found and reoffenders were documented. The data collected during this process has provided the information required to establish the next steps to further reduce contamination. The Recycling and Waste Management Division are conducting recycling audits because the level of contamin contamination in Couch and Valley curbside recycling has been recorded reaching up to 15% by Recycle BC. The goal of the summer audits is to reduce levels of contamination in curbside recycling to below 10% by providing education on recyclables and by refusing con contaminated recycling in hopes to encourage change in recycling habits. The Environmental Technologist One, an environmental resource assistant, audited an average from four to six hours in the mornings ahead of the curbside recycling trucks. After auditing, the remaining time in the day was spent in the office inputting data and catching up on regular duties. Due to holidays, weather, and staff commitments, inspections could not be performed every day. Therefore, auditing staff were out for a total of 21 working days over the six weeks. During the 21 days of auditing, a total of 3,384 totes were inspected and 549 totes were refused for contaminating. We were able to audit an average of 19% of the totes that were placed out for collection and picked up by the truck. 
On average, we refused 17% of the totes that we checked. When auditing st staff re-audited routes, the average improvement rate over the summer was 40%. 40% improvement rate shows that the auditing method used is effective at reducing contamination and providing education. Further reduction of contamination could be achieved if more time and resources are allocated to long-term auditing activity. So there were a lot of figures on the previous slide. So let's zoom in to results from three audits done on our Purple Thursday route. The first audit of Purple Thursday resulted in a 32% refusal rate. On subsequent audits of the Purple Thursday route, auditing staff were able to increase the amount of totes audited from 165 totes to 215 totes, then finally 285, while the refusal rate decreased from 32% to 14% to 9%. The results from Purple Thursday are exactly what we are looking for, but unfortunately, some areas require more than three audits to change their recycling habits, like this route. So the recycling audit procedure consisted of three steps. First, the totes were visually inspected for contamination. If contamination was found, it was documented, and lastly, the tote was refused. A recycling tote rejection was based on the following criteria. If it had more than two or three pieces of film plastic, it was refused. If there were two or more types of contamination, such as a piece of styrofoam and a piece of film plastic, it was refused. If there was a clearly unaccepted um, item, such as food waste, it was also refused. If we found items that damaged the sorting mach machinery, like plastic strapping or ropes, it was refused. And if items which were clearly hazardous were found, such as a propane tank, it was refused. Auditing staff documented the contamination by sending an email to front end staff that included a photo of the contamination with a description as well as the address or serial number of the tote. We documented this way in case residents called and were concerned why their tote wasn't collected. When recycling totes were found to contain contamination, an OOPS sticker, like the one on the screen, noting the contaminant was placed on the lid of the tote. And in totes that had film plastic, a generic no plastic bag and pla no plastic bags and no bagged recycling whoops, sticker was also placed on every tote. For totes that contained contamination that warranted rejection, the tote was turned around and a door hanger listing the accepted and unaccepted materials were, was placed on the handle of the tote. The door hanger ex provided extra educational information and served as a way to notify the drivers not to pick up the tote. All communication material displayed the recycling hotline phone number and website prominently to encourage recycling, or sorry, residents to seek more information. While these audits were taking place, the truck drivers continued to flag contamination using the Innova Suite curbside truck and tote tracking software. Because inspectors were only able to visually inspect about a fifth of the totes that were collected, the drivers flagging totes were still needed for the regular operational procedure of mailing contamination notices to residents with contamination found. So auditing staff documented various types of contamination. Film plastics were found in the majority of totes within the region in varying degrees. We documented that 56% of the contamination was film plastic. Other commonly seen materials included scrap metal, glass, styrofoam, and garbage. The, this contamination demonstrates the need for further education around accepted and unaccepted items despite existing education materials. Auditing staff documented that 56% of the contamination found was film plastic. Film plastic includes two categories, other flexible plastic packaging and plastic bags and overwrap. There are a few examples on the screen of each category. Film plastic is the most common type of 
type of contamination because of the misconception that all plastics are recyclable in curbside recycling. These types of plastics cannot be accepted in curbside recycling because they tangle and break the automated sorting machines. So plastic bags and um, bread bags and bulk food bags and soil bags are pretty common that we know that they're not recyclables, but other flexible plastic packaging is a new category that is being accepted at CVRD recycling centers. Other flex flexible plastic packaging is being collected as part of a research project looking at how it can be recycled or repurposed. Other flexible plastic packaging is harder to recycle than the other category because it has many different types of plastic, many different layers and often many and different types of glues holding it together and it makes the multi-laminated plastic packaging very hard to recycle. Both of these um, uh, types of plastic are accepted at all CVRD recycling centers. And on the next few slides, um, we'll be looking at some of the contamination we found. <laughs> so here we have a chandelier, a metal chandelier with wires on it. Um, we have a bag of garbage and I think a some type of lawn sprayer. Uh, we found a pet carrier on our first day of auditing, which was surprising. And we also found a mop and a few mop handles. Um, styrofoam and plastic strapping are actually quite common and they're not accepted because like I said, it tangles in the machines and styrofoam often crumbles down into little tiny pieces contaminating the other types of recyclables. And we also have a lot of film plastics in the other photo, such as salad bags, um, candy wrappers, and like I said, they're, um, they tangle in the machines and can't be recycled. Here we have chip bags, which are very common, and people, a lot of people don't know that they cannot be accepted in curbside recycling, which we're trying to um, help give them information. And here we have four paint cans which is pretty crazy. And we also found eight hard hats in one tote, but I couldn't find the picture. <laughs> yeah. And lastly, one of our worst contaminators. So here we have film plastic, paper towel, and scrap metal. And unfortunately, we found film plastic, food waste, and maggots in another tote. So what's next? Currently, we are trying to fix some of the issues with the databases so that proper automated monitoring of curbside recycling totes and contamination can continue. In order to reduce levels of contamination in curbside recycling to below 10%, physical audits of curbside recycling should continue. Staff will continue to mail out notices of contaminations to addresses that were flagged for contamination by the truck driver. drivers. Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Rhiannon? Good job. Thank you. That's very good. I just wonder who's, who's, who's on the Purple Thursday route. Maybe, it's <laughs> Maybe we're not allowed to say. It's okay. Okay, any questions for Rhiannon? Okay. Yeah, Director Acton. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, I guess, it, to me, it points out that we really need to do something about the film plastics mm -hmm. to somehow take them, because I know in Nova Scotia they take it and they take fabric and everything, but it sounds like it's, it's a large item. And even myself, with five people, I started collecting it all, and I can fill my trunk up easily in three months, like stacked. And I know that's not heavy material, so mm -hmm. it's not that expensive to ship it off to our imaginary dump, <laughs> but um, it would be nice to know if, if we're planning on doing something about the film plastics. Do you know any talk about that? Yeah, in the we're, it's an issue that we're trying to solve. Yeah, it's kind of complicated. And I, yeah, don't have a full answer. Okay, seeing no other. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Adair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <coughs> the film plastic thing, obviously, it, it is a major issue. Uh, we're, we're always working with Recycle BC to try to make the program easier. But as it stands right now, they're in the foreseeable future, their film plastics will not be part of the curbside program. It's it's funded by Recycle BC. They're trying to find markets. They're finding it more and more challenging every year. 
and introducing another waste stream in, into the current curbside program um, under the current model. I don't see it in, in the near, near future, but would we like to see it in there and have them have a system that, that could accept it? Yes, we would. But uh, as of now, I, I don't see it happening in the near future. It'll have to be at the depots only. And there's things that can be done in terms of making it easier to access depots and partner with other people in the community to accept film plastic. And of course, always continue the education component uh, around that. Um, within the curbside program, film plastic is, uh, it obviously is a major issue, but it, it is very light. And when it comes to the Recycle BC contract, the contamination scorecard is done by weight. So um, it, it's, it, it is a contaminant. Um, one of the things we need to focus on, but it's all, the, the big part of the challenge is things that aren't part of the program, like the paint cans and the people not using the, the program appropriately. Because there is the options for, de there is a depot for that. If you're collecting it and collecting it appropriately, you can deposit it, it's just not in our. That's correct, Madam Chair. So there is options. Director Morrison, then Director Kuhn. Uh, more of a comment than a question in, in that uh, I've uh, got a community member who when we first brought the curbside program in-house uh, sort of identified the fact that contamination would, would be an issue and, and he's been telling me every opportunity that he has that the only way to bring down the contamination is to have a squad of people running around in front of the curbside trucks and, and making sure that the right stuff is in there and the wrong stuff isn't. And uh, it's, it's just kind of ironic and, and funny that, uh, that we would have someone come in and it's a, a neighbor of ours who, uh, who's actually done that work exactly as suggested by my community member and it's shown to work. That's great. So uh, I think yeah. we've got a path forward for uh, addressing our, our um, contamination issue. Yeah, and it's uh, also, I think I've done two or three on recycling because it gets quite complicated for people. They really want to do the right thing, so it's it's the education component um, that we've tried to do in Area D. Director Kuhn. I'm kind of uncertain about uh, bubble wrap. Is it, is it, it's not, it's not film plastic, but is it the normal plastic? It's, it's it, film, it's film plastic because it's soft. Well, some of it isn't really all that soft. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, so I, uh, it's you know. It's film plastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah. I, I have um, Director Smith, Nicholson, and Salmon. Director Smith. Through the Garbage chair. Garbage is always a hot topic. <laughs> Thank you for all your work. I, I think that that's amazing to hear all these statistics. I mean, it's so uh, frustrating that we're trying to move forward to a zero uh, system. And yet, um, you know, people just need education. And there's more and more education. It's clear that once you started the program of marking them, and then they became aware that they were contaminating, uh, they definitely worked at improving what they were doing. So the program that you worked through this summer ref definitely has made a difference. Of course, I must talk about my Thetis Island uh, recycling. I visited them. <laughs> yeah, and, and even there, the plastics is you need, uh, the way that they have it set up, you still need someone, one of the volunteers there, monitoring every minute what people are putting into the two plastic situation mm -hmm. and constantly on it. And <coughs> it's, they're very well educated and when they have a lot of tourists or visitors to the island, they then get educated also and go home with that education. But it is education mm -hmm. and just repetitive. So uh, I think yeah, the work you did this summer was amazing. I looked at a tote this morning that was out early. Excuse me, could I just, just uh, could the gallery please, if you would like a conversation, could you step out into the hall? It's just interfering with the speaker, thank you. This morning on a walk, I uh, saw a tote sitting out and I thought, oh, I'll just peek in it. And my husband's like, no, no, don't look in it. And I said, uh, well, the CVRD owns the tote, so I think I can look in it. And I looked in it and it had so much contamination mm -hmm. inside it. I was really uh, sad to see that. But I think your program that you did this summer is amazing. Thank you. Director Nicholson. Thanks, Rhianne, and good presentation. I think my question is more for Jason. So we get we we get money back from uh, whatever it's called Recycle BC. Recycle BC. So 
how much does it cost to, to do a program like this? Like so we've been giving rebates to people, but maybe we need to put more into this kind of a thing. That, that, that's, uh, that's a good point. The auditing process um, that Rhiannon and uh, Chloe completed this summer, it, it, is, it does take a lot of staff time. So we, uh, on any given day, we might have two, we're completing two routes, and <clears throat> in order to do the audit properly, you need two people in the truck to make it efficient mm -hmm. so, that, so yeah. that they can actually look in the totes and get through the route. But even with that, they, we aren't able to complete an entire route. So it does take a lot of staffing time to do these audits. Um, it, it was a very important to do in order to get the data to see it firsthand and, and get, get a real benchmark. And when you check you know, several thousand homes, we have that benchmark now. And what we're hoping to do is pass it off to the, uh, to the curbside trucks that have the software and the cameras, and they're gonna be re reporting the ca contamination. And then we can follow up to look at the, the repeat offenders. And that, that will lower, the, lower the, the staff time required but there is a significant cost to doing the audit process when you have two staff members out checking totes and um, there, there's just a lot, a lot of routes to check. So. Follow up, Director Nicholson? Right, but I guess what I'm trying to figure out is we get, if we can meet the, uh, the low contamination rate, we get quite a, a significant amount of money from Recycle BC and will that more than cover the cost of the staff time or not? The, the Recycle BC funding is set at a set level. Um, we're required by contract to meet a 3% contamination level, then we hover anywhere between 15 and 11. If, so right now we're obligated to meet a 3% level, and if we do hit it, there isn't any additional funding for hitting that. It's the, the current contractual obligation is to meet 3%, and there's no uh, additional funds if you do meet it. Follow up? Right, I understand that, but they will pull the funding Will they not if we don't meet meet the three percent contamination the, rate? They, the, yes, if the contamination rates continue, there is a possibility that there is a financial penalty uh, in, right. in order to deal with the contamination. So, one option is to take the money that we get from Recycle, Recycle BC and invest regularly invest in this kind of a program. And I'm wondering if that that we have enough money coming back from them to do that. The, the, currently, there isn't. The, the there funding isn't. that we receive for, for the recycling program doesn't uh, cover the entire expense of the program okay, currently. That's what I so want to there, there's additional user fee on top of the Recycle BC funding to, to fund the program. Uh, Director Salmon. Thank you. So just for people that may not know, could you just name the local depots that do take film plastic? Uh, all these, of course, the CBRD recycling centers take film plastic. Uh, where, where are they? Uh, the Bings Creek facility here in North Cowichan and Lake Cowichan's the Mead Creek facility and Peerless Road facility in, in the Lady Ladysmith area. And, and then there's also some private private facilities that accept it, like Fisher Road uh, Recycling. Um, there are some other areas in town. If you look on the Recyclopedia, it lists all of the, uh, all of the depots that will take it. So on our website, there's the Recyclopedia? That's correct, Madam Chair. That people could check and, and follow that link and see to confirm. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, Rhiannon, for the good job. Great job. Turning now to R2. Uh, thank you, Madam, <coughs> excuse me, Madam Chair. Item R2 is a report from the Recycling and Waste Management Division regarding curbside recycling contamination reduction update, and that is for information. Are there any questions on that? That is for information. Everyone seen this report? Staff is here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Following up on the previous presentation, uh, R2 is an update on, on the current uh, efforts made to reduce contamination in the curbside program. There is a number of different activities happening on the education front. Uh, we're, we're using every level we can to try to, to try to change people's behavior. Uh, the recycling markets are changing. They're getting more challenging. We're under more and more pressure from Recycle BC to deliver a, a clean product. Um, so we're, staff are in contact with Recycle BC every week on, on this issue. Uh, what the, the next the next step that we're making, um, piggybacking on the work that Rihanna and Chloe did, is to really step up the enforcement. Um, we have identified. Uh, homes that are really struggling with the program, um, people that are repeat offenders. And so we're, we're gonna start going out and speaking with these people, uh, providing them more resources, and um, come up with other strategies to, to, deal, with, to deal with these folks. Because I've been out myself checking, uh, checking totes, and you know, you'll check 
50 totes and, and they're great and then there's this one one home that's really not using the program appropriately and so we need to come up with a very effective enforcement st strategy for those folks currently we're leaving them behind but it's taken a lot, lot of resources to do that mm. um, and we, we do need to get that contamination rate down so the, the next steps are looking at more enhanced enforcement uh, s strategies to deal with that and of course continue the education that, that, we're, that we're currently doing. Thank you. Director Acton, question for staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in the last presentation, I saw something about the database. I don't know if that was populating the database with proper contact information. And then um, somewhere in this report, I can't find it, but I read about the uh, new software, I think it was somewhere around $12,000 in total or something for yeah. the software. So like are those working together I guess I'm one how much information do you have of people that you can actually use the software to get to them so that let them know they're not doing a good job okay I, I can provide some background on that so so the the current curbside trucks have a software program installed in them so when the driver tips a recycling tote he can look in his hopper and see what's in, see what's been dumped and when he sees a contaminant uh, there's a, a monitor in the cab that pushes a button and it indicates that that home um, has contamination. That goes into the, the database and so uh, we, we have that information to be able to provide that resident. We, we do. Every, every tote is linked to the home so it has an RFID tag in the handle that's attached to the address. And so we've got that, that data, we know the folks that um, are contaminating and we're reaching out to them if, if they do, it, one of the options for the driver is to hit extreme contamination, and when we hit that button, it generates a letter that goes to that resident to explain to them, hey, um, the program isn't being utilized appropriately, and if you need any help, just give us a call. So th that's going to be the primary vehicle to try to re reduce contamination is the software. Um, the challenge with it is that once the material has been dumped, um, you can't take it out. So we have to follow up on the next visit. and and allocate some staff time to go and actually talk to these residents to get them to utilize the program appropriately. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason, for all your work. It's a lot of complicated issues there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. We move on to R3. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Item R3 is a PowerPoint presentation from the Inspections and Enforcement Division regarding building inspections quarterly report and it has to do with 2019's quarter one and quarter two. Welcome Mr. McDonald. Thank you Madam Chair. As it's um, the first quarterly report I've done it's actually a bit two for one to do mm -hmm. for the first two quarters. <laughs> Uh, let's say 2019, 2019 has been a good year. Uh, we started off, it's been very steady. Um, we see a steady flow of permits. Not like a usual ebb and flow where you'll see a development go in and be bombarded in the past as we've seen like up to, I've seen more than once 20 permits show up in one day for houses in certain developments. So anyway, just to say it's a very manageable load right now and, and very steady. Um, as we can see by the numbers, um, quarter two is greatly increased over quarter one. So. We issued 89 permits in the first quarter, but 136 in the second quarter. Um, single family dwellings are up almost double and uh, inspections themselves are up. We're starting to stat inspections, something we didn't do in the past. And the other thing we're doing now is also I've been monitoring the travel that the, the guys have been doing so we can really see what's going on. CVRD is a very large area and this is a big challenge for us. So for the first half totals, uh, we have a total of 225 permits and 64 single family dwellings. Uh, we have 1,062 uh, site-based inspections. And another stat that I thought was very interesting was this 26,000 kilometers traveled. So I went on Google real quick before I came up here to see what that translated to. Turns out that's two-thirds of the way around the world. <laughs> so it's a fair amount of travel being done. Mm. So our first stat breaks down because uh, I know there's some interest to see just what the permits were. So in this case, I've got 64 single-family dwellings. now. A misleading stat, if anybody was really paying attention to the numbers, especially if you saw uh, July's stats, it'll say we're at, I think, currently 60 single-family dwellings. For Stats Canada, what we end up doing is we do a minus. So on the demolition for single-family dwellings, it would take that 64 and minus the 11. So it doesn't really represent what the building department's doing, how busy they are with houses. So I've changed that stat to be more reflective of what's really going on. 
you can see the bulk there too uh, at 64 single family dwellings and 60 renos and 55 garages. That's, that's about 80% of all our permits. So a big thing for us and the challenge for the inspectors is balance. And, whoops, doing too many. So on this slide we're showing, I, I've broken it down to where the permits are issued and the number of inspections done in that area. I can't break down the number of kilometers that go associated with each area, but I can do it this way to show just how um, the time is spent with the guys in the office. So when we look at office time and issuing those permits, they run into some issues where we're seeing a lot more, which I haven't started yet and I probably will start, is stop work orders. This is something in the first few years I was here, we hardly saw any in the last couple of years, and especially I'd say in the last year and a half, uh, I've seen an explosion of them. Um, I think I had counted at one point 13 in the first part of this year, but I didn't carry that stat on. So this takes a lot of valuable resource time and we're not always recouping the costs involved. And I brought this stat up again as one of the old ones, and uh, Director Morrison will be happy to see. I see he's moved up the list. <laughs> and I thought I'd just share you, this has been the package that you could all just see where your area was at. And just before I go to questions, I just also say that as we're going forward, we've been working with, uh, start collaborating with North Cowichan, and we're looking at ways of looking at consistency between the two jurisdictions, of both jurisdictions. And the other thing that's coming up is the step code. So we're looking at uh, an implementation of the step code, but try to work with them as well. So we'll implement it likely at the same time. What I'll do in a future um, meeting is I'll bring a, I'll do reports specific to the step code for those of you who want to know more about it. So other than that, that's all I have today. Any Thank questions? Thank you. I have a one question, Director Acton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I have a question and then a comment. It, so it looks like from Q1 to Q2, your workload has gone up significantly. Yeah. Now, and and your output as well. Is is there a new staff member though? I can't remember in inspection, we, so how are you doing that? We didn't actually hire a new staff member. We do have a now a full-time staff member that was only part-time before, but we've really been managing. I think one thing you did notice in those stats is the number of inspections, even though the permits had slowed down through that period. Um, what we And what I also said earlier in the year, there was 13 plus stop work orders. So we were addressing stop work orders in that time instead of issuing permits. But we did find that time, the, Everybody's flat out, I guess, is the best way to put it. <laughs> Follow up, Director Acton. Thank you. And I guess, um, you know, I always have, I always struggle with these statistics because you're not really sure. Is that a lot? Is that not a lot? <laughs> so I think that environmental services has numbers like the, our growth percentage, how much we've been growing. Like maybe if those were easy to access, we could have those on there too. And then we can see, oh, okay, well, area B is growing. Yeah. Like I know that people in area B sometimes start panicking that there's all this growth because they see places being built. And then the statistic I heard that we've only grown 6% since 2011. So <laughs> it would be, I think, if we had those there, I don't know if, how other people yeah. feel, but th those would be really helpful to me. I have a, um, so in the next report that's coming mm -hmm. is the, is the July report. That. that does have a five-year trend in it, or yeah, five-year trend, but I am a kind of a stats person, so I stat a lot of things, and I try to bring the ones that are relevant, so if there are ones that you want, I'm more than happy to amass the ones <laughs> that I have to, maybe that helps you with, uh, if there's something here that you don't want. So maybe I can talk to you after the meeting and you can tell me if there's something more specific that's not on this one. Thank you, Director Salmon. Just on the stop work orders, do you have any uh, guess what we're explanation for why the increase is that I'll I can't explain why people are doing it but they I can say that the bulk of them are people building without permits and we are finding them and we are taking them to task okay but what would explain more more now than previously is it that one I cannot explain <laughs> director Nicholson I got a couple of questions but first I, I'm curious about shipping container permits what what are the rules around shipping containers Originally, they weren't regulated, and so what we did is we did put them in our building bylaw that they would need a permit. This allowed us to regulate where they went on the property. So some zonings allow them, some do not. So we just take a fee to make sure that they are located on the property where um, we're permitted as per the zoning okay. bylaw. I didn't realize that we had any rules about them. Um, can I do a follow-up? Yes. So I'm wondering, I, I could, I'm a little bit confused about R3 and R4. So what, uh, I'm just trying to figure, oh no. <laughs> out, figure out what I'm supposed to think about this information that you give us. I, 
I can explain that one, I think. Um, we had decided, or you had decided, that the monthly report was a bit much. So I would do a quarterly report. So that's why I'm trying to, where I will come up and present it. But otherwise, you would get, just in the package, you would get this report for, for two of the two months in a row, and then I'll present. Mm -hmm. Okay, Unfortunately, so just timing ways, I had to do them both at the same time. I was hoping to have this one ready for lab, but I couldn't. Mm. Okay, so essentially they're all about the same thing. So, yes, this, this one's a month ahead, though. <laughs> so, so what I would be interested to know, because it, from, a, from a resourcing and budgeting perspective, um, like what's the backlog? Currently right now? Yeah, like how many applications for building permits have you got that you haven't dealt with? I mean, you always tell us what you what's what's on, ongoing that's happen, happening, but what's the backlog, and how many move through the system in a timely way so that you can get on with new ones? So, uh, yes, you, I, you I know, understand you your question. It's a very good question. Um, I, I I hate to hazard a guess. I have a rough idea, but I I say I hate to hazard a guess in front of you. I last time I asked the, all the inspectors what they had sitting on their desks, it amounted to about forty-five or fifty permits all at various stages, obviously not issued. Um, beyond that, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Um, well, yes, and the time it takes to oh, move uh, through, a, the average time it takes to move through the different kinds of permits. That is a more difficult question to answer because it's going to depend on uh, some other variables, and we've seen a lot of them actually uh, in the planning stages now. So some people might be variances and development permits, so these will slow some down where we have other ones that don't require that and they come with a complete package, and typically a turnaround on that would be possibly two weeks. Okay, so, well, just, just that we ended up with a huge backlog in planning in the application front, and it just seems to me that it would be useful to, to track that and so that we kind of have an idea of when things are starting to get out of hand, if, you know. I think that would be very valuable, and, and I will add that to the future stats. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much. Dr um, Ms. Cheryl? Oh, you have to turn on your mic. Thank you. Madam Chair, Land Use Services um, has been directed um, to report back before I believe it's November 2019 on uh, workload and uh, file status in development services and we could certainly add information related to building permit processing at that time. Thank you. Okay, R4. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Item R4 is a report from the Inspections and Enforcement Division regarding the July 2019 building report, and this again is for information. Yeah. Director Morrison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, <clears throat> through you to Mr. McDonald, I think I'm going to screenshot, print, color, and uh, frame it and put it somewhere <laughs> because I can't remember ever in the time that I've been here having the, uh, being in Area F, having the third highest building <laughs> permit value. We are always in last place and, and this, is, pr this yeah. is pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and this is good material for, for us and, and, and just in respect to what Director Nicholson had, had asked, I think that what I'm hearing from people that are actually building homes and, and engaged in, in dealing with our, our staff that, uh, we're, we're actually pretty close to what our, our municipal neighbors are, are doing in, in the way of processing applications and the like. And, and I think people are generally getting pretty good service. So uh, I'm, I'm pleased to get this information, but the additional information will be helpful as well. So thank, thank you so you. much. Moving on now to R5. Thank you, Madam Chair. Item R5 is a report and PowerPoint presentation from Inspections and Enforcement Division regarding the soil deposit file update, and again, for information. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just step here. <laughs> so, long overdue soil deposit update. So I'll be presenting myself. I'm gonna do a short presentation and then I'm gonna have Devin show you all the wonderful things that have happened recently. I'm just going to do a little bit of a brief history. And uh, one was the, uh, the purpose of the bylaw, uh, just to refresh your resume. The, the, the purpose of the bylaw was to strictly to regulate deposit of soil within all electoral areas. Uh, as we always remember, it was a very long process. It took about two years to, to get it adopted and uh, went through various drafts. We involved a lot of public consultation. 
Uh, we reviewed other districts' bylaws, and we also met CVRD's needs. Uh, just so you're aware, there are three types of permits. There's a type A for less than 100 cubic uh, meters per calendar year. It's all volumetric. Type B is between 100 uh, cubic meters and 1,000 cubic meters in a year. And type C is over 1,000 cubic meters in a year. So we, we decided to take a soft approach when introducing the bylaw. So after its adoption, 2000, or, uh, April 24th, 2019, um, we set so that type C's would be coming into effect on June 3rd this year, and the type A's and B's will not be till June 1st of next year. So originally, as we all remember, there was a lot of opposition. We did a lot of consultation with the uh, owners and business operators. I spent a lot of time myself on the phone, emails, tried to respond to everybody and douse their fears of what was going to happen. One of the biggest concerns I had gotten was that our bylaw as it was written would in essence shut all down all currently active sites. So what we did is um, we came up with a policy which is the sole deposit bylaw enforcement grace period policy and this would allow current operators to continue operating. So here we are to now and uh, four months later and I'm not going to talk much about this because I'm really not going to take Duffin's uh, presentation away from because he's got most of this in there. But we have talked a little bit about how many permits we have there. We have actually had 13 Type C permits. So pretty much everybody we thought would come in came in and applied. Um, I put the phone stop ring as my last point on here. And this is actually due to Devin's hard work and how he educated all the people who thought that this was really going to be hard to implement, how onerous it was going to be on them. They've all been very good. And I think to date, um, I say we're very pleased at how it's been implemented. And at that, I am going to pass it off to Devin to run him through his presentation. Sure. Welcome, Devin. Thank you. So I want to start this. Uh, we uh, we started this this bylaw. We were working with the Ministry of Transportation, and uh, they were very generous to offer us their signage when the bylaw was uh, adopted, so that it was on the side of the road, people could drive by. I had a lot of people calling as soon as those signs came up. So that's made it very easy for me to uh, educate everybody that saw the sign that called in. Um, and so it's it, a lot of it is the help that our partners in the different agencies has given us as well. So we have some of the main areas that the uh, soil applications are. This is the south end of Shawnigan Lake. Um, there's a little bit hard to see, but the brown uh, outlined areas are the ones with pending applications. There's other things such as old um, sites that were dumping occurred before the uh, the bylaw was uh, introduced. So we identified those, and there's also another area is the um, the uh, uh, farmland, which is um, exempt from the bylaw for most most uh, of the activities that go on there. Um, this is near the uh, South Shawnigan turnoff. Once again, you can see there's areas in uh, brown are the ones that have applications. Um, there is the ones with the red dots are sites that have uh, mining uh, applications in with the Ministry of Energy and Mines. So those sites uh, are exempt for the most part. If the uh, mining uh, activity is only on part of the site, the site that doesn't have uh, the mining permit and they want to do anything with soil, uh, they still do have to apply for a permit on them. And this is uh, closer to Bamberton. So once again, you can see on the far right, there's the three dots. Um, they're not exactly in the location where the permit is, but the black outlines are the Bamberton mining permit areas. And above it, on the brown is where they've applied for uh, a site. Now, the, the, that is the whole lot, but the, the permit site is very small in that, so it doesn't overlap any of the mining uh, activities. So this is going on to a site. So I'm, I've documented this. You can see where soil has been deposited and the, the smooth areas, they, they deposit and compact it and they're preparing it for, for more loads uh, to make sure that there's no sloughing or movement of the material once it's applied. This is 
area that has been mostly completed. You can kind of see that they've, they have adds, added some seating to the areas with slopes to, to get it um, so it's more the retention of material once, it, once they've completed. They, they do things like uh, hydro seeding, which is spraying grass seed on, and it bonds and then starts growing very well. And this is one that it's more um, rough at this stage. They're still depositing. Uh, the final slopes are not there yet. But you can see that the uh, material gets deposited and then pushed around with a dozer into the, in, and filling in areas. And then they keep building from there. And this is areas that are m more complete uh, as to the levels, but no um, grass, grass seed or anything. The trucks will be driving through these areas to deposit on. Uh, new areas that are yet to be filled yet. This is a uh, typical activity on the site. You can see dump trucks coming uh, on this. Uh, they'll be going to the edge of an area, depositing and then driving out. Um, just this kind of what you see if you're going to these sites, the, the activity that you monitor on a daily basis. And this, this is an area that is was actually deposited on before the bylaw was implemented. So the, I do go out and check on these areas to make sure that nothing new is coming to them. And though we don't have any ability to regulate what happened in the past, we do want to make sure that if anything new is coming to the areas, we do keep an eye on it. And if it is, then I will be making sure that they uh, put in an application. So this is an active site. You can see different uh, activities going on there. There's, there's some gravel that they've put on uh, areas to keep the dust down and keep the mud down. Uh, the, the picture on the right is an apron. Uh, so they pave that entrance to keep dust from going out on the street. This is one of the requirements uh, is to keep dust down on the street. Uh, they need an industrial access permit through the Ministry of Transportation. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the better ways to get approval is to have that paved apron so that when the mud, it has an opportunity to come off on private land and be cleaned before it enters the street. There's also a, uh, a gate uh, across that property. So at the end of the uh, day, they, are, they close it to limit access to the site. This is a, um, a site that we actually put a stop work order on because there was activity going on in here that was not approved. Um, some of it was before the uh, implementation of the bylaw, but there was material still arriving on the site after the, after the bylaw was implemented. Um, there was no, no application on this site either. Um, this, this site uh, has, it, so, so there's a stop work on it. There, we have uh, contact with the uh, Ministry of um, uh, Natural Resources, et cetera, so um, to, to work with them on remedying it. So this is some of the material we see on the site. Uh, it's going down right into the water course. Um, that part is within the control of the province, so that's where we contacted them and are working with them. Um, they do have a plan in place to correct this issue, so um, it's it's very very close to completion. They they should be starting to work on it very soon. And this is the sort of issues that arise from it. You can see there's sediment in the water course there. That's there's no um, they have no sediment control in this respect. And in our bylaw, we have requirements for sediment control. So now that we have this bylaw in place things like this will not happen anymore. We'll be able to monitor it and prevent, it, prevent things like this. And this is uh, an application that we received um, just recently. Um, we're just vetting it right now. Before, so soon it will be ready to come before the board and we will have, a, have an application that uh, is set to be come up for approval. And hopefully they all come up there like this. Uh, it's, quite in-depth. It has all the details that we're concerned about um, prepared by a professional. So yeah, we're very pleased with that. And I'm sure like there's more that will be coming very soon. Thank you so much. That you're was welcome. great information. Before I go to Director Acton, I just have a question. To know what is old and new, 
um, because we're such a large rural area, I mean, dumping could be happening anywhere. Do you use any kind of aerial photos? How would you assess that? So on new sites, most of them require, like they, they are doing their own aerial photos, um, doing a, a LIDAR and such to identify the areas that they have. Um, I personally try to get out to every single site and I've documented pictures from every site so that I can go back and review my pictures to see when there's new material, is it, is it in the areas that we are uh, looking at the permits. Um, the only issue is, once again, we are so big, there is areas that we don't, we don't know about and um, if I, I get calls, people do identify when there's sites that it might be something that nobody, there's nothing wrong, but it could be a site that there's issues. So I've gone out to sites that um, say took, uh, one took, I think it was about 20 loads, um, which is would be a type B permit, but we're not there yet. So uh, I checked the site, I documented it. So in the future I can come back and, and monitor that site to make sure that they are not exceeding that amount. Um, but we do rely a lot on uh, people calling in from the community and identifying areas. Um, so it's, like I said, it is difficult, um, but we are doing our best to try and identify every area we can and keep track of them all. Thank you, Director Acton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Devin. Um, I guess my, I'm curious, I have a few questions. I'm curious about uh, whether the permits or our pricing and everything that we were trying to uh, debate about is is effective. We you said, you know, we didn't want to stop it, but we did want to be competitive and, and, and not incur necessarily encourage more trucks from Victoria. So are we, com are we on par with Victoria is one question. And are we seeing less trucks on the road? Because my community, or South Cowichan is still kind of anxious about the number of trucks on the road. And I think our purpose was kind of to limit that a little bit. So would be nice to know what we can tell the community. I think the prices are are in the realm of, of what they should be. Um, as far as Victoria goes, it appears that there is nowhere to dump in Victoria. So the reality is is this is the next best place to come. And um, the the trucks that are coming, there there is added fees now. The, the people are paying the fees. We do have um, volumetric fees coming in uh, from from them. The, I have quite a few uh, of the June fees. Most of them, the requirement is six months for the payments, but most of them want to pay when, when they receive the money, which is on average about two months. That's a, a commercial um, normal is to have uh, six, six months plus two weeks to pay. So the, the money's coming in. Um, I don't think it, comparing it to anywhere else, I don't think the, the prices, they're definitely not the, the lowest volumetric fees out there. They may not be the highest, but I think it's, it is in the realm where it should be. Um, as far as reducing trucks, um, I, I, I have nowhere to go with numbers from before because nobody kept track of them. So uh, it's, it is the busy time of year. Um, most of the sites I talk to are expecting most of the trucks showing up now because as soon as the weather shifts, the, the trucks will be reduced. Um, I don't think any of them are, are looking to, to stop because of the costs. The, it's just, it's an added cost that, that is part of the um, business of, of doing this. Uh, beyond that, uh, I can't really tell you what uh, if, if anybody was looking elsewhere because of this bylaw being active. Follow up, Director Acton. Thank you. Um, a few months ago, I also I sent in some photos. I was in Surrey and they have road signs, just small ones that say, you know, we have soil bylaws in effect because they went through the same similar uh, pains as we have with a large city next door and just warning people that there is a bylaw and that it is enforced. And have we been talking to MOTI to do anything like that? Uh, I believe we have not talked to them about uh, requesting places for road signs. Um, we, we do, we educated all the uh, businesses. Um, reality is all the trucking companies 
should know exactly how the bylaw is, so a sign, I'm not sure how much difference it would make if they want to uh, do something against our bylaw. I, I don't think a sign's gonna make any difference because they, they do all know um, the, the, there's, because we're on a s smaller area, there's the Island uh, Equipment Operators Association. They're well aware of our uh, bylaws. So they do, they do educate all their drivers. So, I mean, it is something that if, if there's a budget for it available, we could consider it for sure. Director Kuhn. I take it the most, the <laughs> largest amount of the material comes from Victoria. Do we know where from in Victoria these loads come? Uh, most loads are coming from large uh, developments, uh, like the downtown area, the uh, Mackenzie Interchange has been a large right. depositor up here. Uh, but um, there, any of the, if you happen to drive into Vic downtown Victoria, you'll see that any of those sites, they're digging down like 60, 70 feet. So there's massive volumes coming out in comparison to uh, like a small house, you may remove four or five loads, six loads mm -hmm. to build a house. They've got like a thousand truckloads coming out of uh, Mackenzie Interchange. It's, and so the, there's a huge volume coming up from those areas. Um, the other one uh, uh, in Langford area, the, there's the uh, Royal Bay area. There's a lot of material coming out from there as well. Follow up, so, Dr. Coon? So I imagine much of that material is not really uh, uh, contaminated, let's say. I'm, I'm interested in one project. They, they recently did this, this large amount of digging in the harbor where, where that park used to be. Are we sure that this stuff doesn't end up in, in Shawnigan? Because that was contaminated. There was a paint plant there and, and, and there was a big write-up about it. And, and every time I go to Victoria, I see that big site there and I thought, man, that'd be tempting to dump that in Shawnigan. That, uh, that cleanup was uh, a joint operation with, with the province. Um, they regulate a contaminated fill, so they would be dealing with that in an appropriate manner. Okay, thanks. Director Nicholson. Thank you. I got a bunch of questions, but I'd like to first understand how much does a truck carry? So we, the easy way to calculate it is a single truck which has two rear axles and one front axle would be approximately 10 meters. Then you have what's called a truck and a pup which is a small two axle trailer. So that would approximately be 20 meters and then you have one with four rear axles on the trailer and that's a, called a quad and that would be approximately 330 cubic meters. Now that's approximate because different materials can weigh substantially mm -hmm. different amounts including whether it's wet or dry. So uh, a wet load you might half that. Um, so it, it, it does vary but uh, that's the rough estimate. So that's the average trucks that you see coming up here is just a single truck, truck and pup or a quad. Okay. So Follow up. So are we going to see applications? You sort uh, of indicated that. That is correct. So the applications for type C's come before the board. Um, we are in the process of vetting uh, applications right now. And because I, I don't want to see applications come where we see glaring defects in them. So when I see something that possibly the applicant has missed, I will uh, talk mm -hmm. to them about it and see if we can get the uh, deficiencies corrected so that when the application comes forward, it's as c complete as possible. But but you've already issued 13 that we haven't seen? Uh, so we had a grace period, which was to allow these uh, companies uh, to continue operation, but the grace period ends on September 3rd. So this was giving them time to get their application together. So at that point, September 3rd comes. Now I know that it takes a while to get them up to the board, so if someone has a complete okay. application and they apply for an extension, uh, we have the ability to grant an extension. Um, we'll be looking at how complete the application is before we would consider granting an, an, an extension on that time. So, so I guess so. I guess in fact, in effect, we're looking at projects that have already started. So it's it makes it more complicated to assess the environmental consequences and so forth. If 
uh, the reality <laughs> is that these sites were all operating before the yeah. implementation okay. of the bylaw, so that's quite, uh, we can't really assess what was there on site before the bylaw started anyways, so. So my other um, angle of inquiry here is, <laughs> Um, community is really concerned about soil deposit. So what uh, I noticed, I looked at the website, what we've got on the website, which is all, you know, the basic information about needing to have a permit and so forth. Do we, um, sh should we be posting like how many permits have been issued or, or is there any intention to do that so that people understand if trucks are happening in an area that they actually probably have a permit or they don't have a permit and they should maybe contact you or? How does that work? So once uh, the, we, we haven't uh, identified any because it, being that it's a grace period, we're not considering them complete applications. So we don't want to identify sites and claim that they have a permit, okay. which is not actually there. Uh, once the permits are, uh, someone has a permit, we will be uh, r requiring them to post signage that gives them their permit number and information about the site. That is actually in the bylaw that it's required. Um, we uh, have looked at having online um, documentation as well, but we haven't quite uh, worked through what will happen in that respect. Thank you. Okay, Director Salmon. Yeah, thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, two questions. Um, well, the, the 13 major Type C permits, is that, in your estimation, is that all of them that there, there should be? All the large sites are now permitted? Um, so when you say large permit sites, I do have some uh, people with uh, larger uh, house properties that wish to um, apply for permits. I haven't received any applications and they have missed the uh, uh, grace period. So they have to apply before they can even bring the material in beyond the scope of a type B permit. But uh, there, there's quite a few lots that people purchase these lots and look at them and think, geez, it would be nice to have flatter land that yeah. would require massive amounts of filling to get. And it may not be the same as one of these sites that's doing these, these very large fill sites, but it still is beyond, uh, like they would require a type C. So I suspect some of these applications will be coming in for those sites. Um, I can't say when they do. I just know that I've had people come in and ask about them. I've given them the information, given them the application sheets, and uh, we'll see if they come forward with them or not. All right, but it sounds like all the big existing sites do have their... Correct. So the, the sites that we, we considered just fill sites have all put in their applications. Uh, Follow-up? Follow up, yes. On, on the fees, do you have any sort of uh, estimate of revenues that uh, will be coming in? annually say or we're we're not quite there to to estimate that um, I I'll leave that to uh, uh, the manager to discuss that part so we're, we're, we don't have all the numbers yet so we're just in the process of to, to estimate it would be it would be inappropriate, I think, at this point. So we are looking at, because one, we haven't had some of them pay through this grace period, but we have, Devin has been monitoring log books. So we're getting a rough idea, but I would say at this point to actually put that estimate out would not be right until we have actually run this probably for a couple more months and then we'll be able to bring that forward and have revenues and some other numbers that have been requested. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to, so are there no other questions on the soil bylaw? I'd like to thank you very much for all your work and thank you for your presentation. And we're going to have a five minute break. So thank, thank you. you. Before we go on to R6. Everybody's good? Welcome back, and we move on to our R6. Hello, everybody. All right, I'm here to present an OCP amendment rezoning and ALR application for 3741 Holland Avenue. So the subject property is located in Cobble Hill near the Trans Canada Highway. 
It's about 20.2 hectares or 50 acres in size. Uh, it's the location of Cedars at Cobble Hill, which is an alcohol and drug addiction treatment center, for those of you that aren't aware. So in terms of site context, there are currently four patient houses an administrative building, dining hall, meeting and treatment room, as well as a chapel, in addition to a few smaller buildings, but these are the main ones of interest. So the land, or the subject property is within the agricultural land reserve. It's currently zoned, ag or sorry, designated agricultural and split zoned uh, P2 <coughs> institutional and small lot agricultural A2. Existing on-site services include CVRD Community Service System as well as the on-site well. So there's quite a comprehensive proposal here which I'll walk you through. So the proposal includes um, new buildings which includes a patient treatment building, patient residence, family program, kitchen expansion, relocating the Cedar House, planters, and new road slash parking area. This also includes a master plan as is part of an ALC application. So not only includes the new buildings, uh, it also includes relocating existing buildings that are not in compliance with our regulations, as well as an agricultural development plan, which you can see here in the cross hatching, which is an area dedicated to agricultural activities related to the treatment center. So in order to implement this master plan, it requires a non-farm use application. Um, one, to approve existing buildings that never received non-farm use approval, as well as proposed buildings and infrastructure um, that would require non-farm use approval. This would also trigger an OCP amendment as the current use of the portion in blue is institutional, but it's actually designated agricultural, so we have no policies to support this use. So it's a uh, cleanup measure in terms of proper planning practices. There's also a zoning amendment. So this includes ensuring that all of the existing buildings associated with the treatment center are actually within the institutional zone, um, as well as doing a bit of a cleanup in terms of uh, odd property line or odd um, zoning boundaries based on historic <coughs> activities. So as you can see, there's a significant part of the land to the right that was, cur was is currently zoned uh, institutional, but is actually proposed to be zoned to agricultural. So this application was referred out to the following agencies. So the Joint APC, the Couch and Volunteer Fire Rescue, First Nations Governments, Island Health, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, as well as internal CVRD departments, including public safety, environmental services, water management, inspection and enforcement, community planning, and economic development. In general, uh, the referral agencies that responded were in support of the application. Um, there were a few requests from our environmental services division in regards to setting a number of conditions with the uh, uh, application and one includes uh, setting up a statutory right of way to monitor uh, groundwater not only for uh, potential contamination but supply and uh, uh, quality and that's uh, part of the issue with across the street there being the uh, nitrate issue with the old greenhouses. Um, there also is a request to have a proof of water license through FLINRO through the Water Sustainability Act as they currently don't have um, a water license as per the Act's requirement. So the recommendation to the board is that the OCP and zoning amendment bylaws be prepared for application and forwarded to the board for consideration of just first reading. Um, that's because we have a policy currently in place within our OCP that states um, amendment bylaws need to receive first reading prior to being forwarded to the ALC for consideration. So we're just following that policy. Uh, that following consideration of first reading of the OCP and zoning amendment bylaws, the non-farm use application be forwarded to the Agricultural Land Commission uh, with a recommendation for approval. That prior to consideration and adoption of the amendment bylaws, a uh, new statutory right-of-way be registered in favor of the CVRD uh, to allow for the future installation of a groundwater quality and supply monitoring well. 
four, that prior to consideration of adoption of the amendment bylaws, uh, proof of water license be provided. And last, the acceptance of the referral responses from the agencies. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I have Director Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, we, um, the APC, the joint APC did a tour of this, um, of this facility. They, they, they do work up there and it's not just drug and alcohol addiction that they treat. There are members of the Canadian Armed Forces which are admitted as well, PTSD and things like that, which, um, which is a big step forward. Uh, the joint APC recommended approval without conditions or concerns, so I have uh, no, no doubts about recommending that this uh, be accepted uh, and uh, move that it be approved. It's been moved. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Any other questions? Director Morrison. Yeah, just through you, Madam Chair, to staff. Um, I read the, the report, and, and it looks to me like uh, there's an acknowledgement that there might have been some uh, unapproved uh, improvements that had, had happened on the site. Now that's going to be corrected, and then it looks like the, the master plan is sort of their vision for, for moving forward. Do you have a, a sense of... Uh, of uh, uh, willingness to adhere to the, the, the terms and the, the overall perspective of the master plan? Yeah, these have been excellent applicants that I've been dealing with, so I have no hesitation in terms of them actually following that master plan. And I also want to mention that applicants are here and they would like to speak following any questions that may arise. Okay, Director Wilson. Yeah, just very quickly on, on the follow-up to what uh, Director Morrison, uh, Chairman Morrison said, uh, as far as I can remember from the inspection that we did, there was a very mi minor infraction of one of the buildings into uh, an ALR. I think it was less than two metres, and that was uh, one of the things that was going to be uh, corrected, and I'm sure the applicants will correct me on that if that's wrong. Uh, it's related to uh, the building being within the agricultural zone. Um, yes, and in terms of the infractions about non-farm use approval, as a CVRD, we didn't inform them through building permits that the ALR approval was required, so that's historic activity. It's been happening over 20 plus years, so it's just a matter of rectifying it now. Director Salmon. Just on, on the drinking water, um, what, what is the quantity standard for um, this type of, of use, and, and is there a quality standard as well? Uh, there is a quality standard that uh, the Ministry of Forest, Lands and Natural Resources does have for this kind of use. Um, I don't recall the exact number off the top of my head, but they do have a specific number that they have to meet. And from my understanding, there has been well testing and you are have sufficient water to not only meet existing demands, but future expansion. Okay. Yeah, they do have that data. Okay, seeing no other questions, I'm going to call it. All in favor? Any opposed? motion is carried and that will go to which board 28th august 28th thank you moving on to r7 sorry just a sec we've um moved along i didn't request the applicant so would you like a follow-up i could could you follow up with them later or would you like it now Okay. Okay. If you just want to do the quantity, quality, uh, a question on water, just be, if you want. Okay. Uh, Eighty gallons per day is the uh, requirement uh, per patient, and uh, so what we would envision in this master plan, uh, we would be maxing around ninety to one hundred patients. Which so, if you work that out, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of eighty or eight thousand gallons per day. The well was just tested, and it's 60,000 gallons per day. Uh, so we'll be well within that. And uh, as, as mentioned here, with the um, uh, addition of a monitoring well, I think we're good. And we do monitoring on this all the time. So VHA gets water testing done all uh, just constantly. Just follow so up. That's it. And the, the quality standard as well? Uh, so I don't have that memorized, oh, okay. um, but uh, VHA gives that to us, and we submit to them. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to R7. Thank you, Madam Chair. Item R7 is a report from the Development Services Division regarding DP 18C12, which is Development Permit Application 1231 Hutchison Road, applicable to Parcel Identifier 004, uh, 832, 
0.566, and that report has two options. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the item before you is a development permit application relating to a four-lot subdivision at 1231 Hutchinson Road. And a development permit is required pursuant to the Cobble Hill Village Development Permit Area. And this is subject property, which is located in Electoral Area C, and it has frontage on both Hutchinson Road and Dugan Drive. And the lot is two hectares in size and is zoned uh, Village Suburban Residential R2. And the aerial view of the property here, um, the southern portion of the lot contains a dwelling and active horse farm, and the remaining northern portion is treed. The lot is long and narrow, and uh, there are similar lots on either side, as you could tell from the uh, subject property map. And they're also zoned R2 as well. Uh, this is a subdivision plan and shows the parcel divided into four. Uh, two lots front on Hutchinson Road and two lots on Road. And one of the lots on each road frontage has a panhandle configuration, so I've tried to highlight those boundaries in red. Um, the lots will be serviced by the Cobble Hill Improvement District, which is a community water service and on-site sewerage systems. And the lots meet the zoning bylaw requirements and uh, sufficient information has been provided to satisfy the development permit area guidelines as detailed in the staff report. And staff considers this application to have met the intent of the development permit guidelines and has recommended approval and the applicant Denise Kors is also in attendance. Okay. Thank you. Would the applicant wish to add anything? Okay. Director Wilson. Oh, sorry, Director Acton, yes, you're correct. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair and Director Wilson. Um, I, I'm in favor of this application, but uh, I'm just curious, I, I didn't, I'm confused why a four subdivision has come here. I thought that we don't, it's over three? Yeah, I thought it would be up to the Ministry of Transportation. Um, do you mean? Um, it's the opposite. So it does require board approval for the development permit. For so not for the subdivision part. That was already pre-approved. Okay. Director Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, we uh, the APC did uh, visit the site and uh, took a good look around, had a very good uh, explanation from the developer and from his consultant, and um, we, we don't see a problem here at all, and I'd uh, recommend that uh, approval be granted on this one. So you're moving... Okay. Okay, it's been woo, moved and seconded. Okay, any more questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried and that will go to August 28th board. Thank you so much. Moving on now to, is there any unfinished business? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, there is none. And I see we have no new business and we go straight to question period. So questions shall be addressed to myself and must be truly questions and not statements of opinions. Questioners are not permitted to make a speech. Is there anybody in the gallery that has a question? <coughs> Madam Chair, on the uh, recycling, I was just thinking that uh, on around a lot of the lakes, we have temporary uh, residents there otherwise some people own homes and are there for two months of the year and then they are rented out the rest of the year is there any way that uh, we can have lists there for recycling for some of these people I've been going around the lake uh, checking water uh, for the milfoil project and I'm surprised and appalled at what I see at some of the uh, recycling bins. They throw out all their returnable bottles, everything. Uh, last week I was um, at a place and I see people there from Quebec. They have no idea what our bylaws are or anything like that. So if we had those stickers, I wonder if we could have stickers on the bins or in those rental houses. I think that would help our contamination uh, rate quite a bit. 
Very good points. And um, yeah, I'm not sure that we would be able to task with our rentals, but I did hear from people that have B&Bs and also Airbnbs, and they said that they were putting that inside their buildings for people, but I'm not sure if that's being followed or updated. So that is a good point on the rentals. Thank you very much, Thank Ms. You. Madam Chair. Okay, so a motion to go into closed, a motion to, that the, it's been moved and seconded that the meeting be closed to the public in accordance with the Community Charter Part 4, Division 3, Section 90, subsection as noted in accordance with each agenda item. So we'll give five minutes to, oh, all in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Anxious to get into closed.